If everybody could go ahead and get settled in, we'll try and get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you've been hearing the name Mike Carter uh, for the past couple of weeks as the guy's going to teach your Sunday school class. Well, this is what you get. So let me just uh, welcome you all here and. Um, and I will give you just a quick word of introduction in just a moment, but um, I want to open us up with the, one of, John Calvin is one of my favorites. Okay, you're going to get so tired of hearing me say one of my favorites because there are so many great reform writers, and, and of course John Calvin is, is the king of the Reformation. Uh, but I just saw this one this week, and uh, believe it or not, I saw it on Facebook, and there are some good things on Facebook, so if you're not part of the Reformed uh, Theology community on Facebook, it's a great thing for you to, to get into. You get lots of pointers to great articles to read, and it's a good thing to do. But uh, Dr. Calvin said this, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth was attacked and yet would remain silent. That's what this class is all about, is to become very, very familiar with God's truth. And so familiar with it that when somebody does attack it, or even when somebody comes and brings you a question that you would like to be able to answer, that you'll have some more knowledge to reach back into that knowledge bank that you have, and then to apply it to that particular answer. And I will admit one fault of mine very quickly is that uh, when somebody attacks, I attack back. I'm not really good at being, you know, slow to anger, <laughs> quick to listen, and quick and slow to speak. So I would just encourage you all just to, to take as much as you can away from this, uh, from this study as you possibly can. It's a great study. And uh, one that I'm very, very blessed. And, and Brent Cochran, who's going to be teaching half the lessons as well, we both feel very blessed uh, to have this opportunity to do it. So let's open up. Tom, would you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. Thank you, brother. One of the uh, most important lessons that I've learned since coming to uh, Harvest, uh, and first of all, you're going to hear me call this church Eastwood Presbyterian, which was two churches ago, and Covenant Presbyterian was our last church. I'm, it's going to take me a while to get it right, so if you hear either one of those, I really mean Harvest. But one of the most important lessons that I learned is um, when Tom and Eric invite you for coffee, it's usually not about coffee. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Tom had heard uh, a lot about my background uh, the previous weekend, and then uh, Eric heard about it as we got together. And I've been a, an elder in two different PCA churches, not because I was run out of either one of them, I promise, but because, uh, like many of you here, I, I was in the military. I did 26 years in the Air Force, and uh, there is another military, okay? <laughs> and... Uh, and Tom and I, in fact, were talking that same time, and, and Tom told me that he uh, really was interested in the Air Force, but he decided to go into the military instead. So, so that's how he ended up being a Marine. But okay, you've got all my good material. So uh, let's, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the youngest of seven children, and uh, I was raised in a very, very happy and devout Catholic home. And to this day, um, I am the only non-Catholic in my family. And let me take the opportunity of this, uh, this lectern to, to ask your prayer also for my oldest brother, Percy. Percy's 86 years old. 
Uh, he is literally probably in the last hours of his life. And um, he lives in Nashville and his family's with him. And um, so I would just ask your prayer for Percy Carter and his family during these last hours. Uh, my grandchildren sent my brother Percy a, a letter just a few weeks ago. And I don't know what was in that letter, but I do know that Percy res was so impressed by it that he responded uh, to, to my grandkids. And one of the things that he said in that letter was uh, about God. He says, I'm not an atheist. I believe in God, but I believe that there are many ways to him. And so what we're going to do during this study is we're really going to focus on the fact that there is one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no way to the Father except through me. And I want you, as a result of the study, to have a little bit more ammunition in your pocket uh, to be able to answer somebody that asks you, you know, isn't there multiple ways to God? And I want you with, um, with knowledge and love to be able to respond to them, no. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way to the Father. But uh, just to get back quickly to my story, I uh, was raised in, in this very close com community in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, if I did anything in school, my mom knew about it before I got home. And, and that's no joke. Um, her sister was a nun at the Catholic school that I taught at, and so if something happened, mom knew about it quickly. And uh, judgment, swift judgment, the wrath of mom, as we called it, you know, was meted out. But, you know, I always was a pretty good kid because there was always somebody watching. But then I enlisted in the Air Force at 17, and uh, I went to basic training, and I found out my TI may have been watching, but nobody else was, and nobody else cared. And so my life turned, uh, took kind of a, a bad turn. I was just kind of crazy, you know. I could tell you about drug use. I could tell you about just all, it would all be a lie if I told you that. But what I could tell you about was that uh, my life just changed and it just went a little while. And, uh, you know, but I met Maggie when I was 21 uh, and just immediately knew this is the person that I was going to spend my life with. And that was, you know, 50 years ago that we met. And uh, we've been married 48 years. We have three boys, and they're 45, 43, and 39. We have 10 grandchildren, and we have one great-grandchild. So, uh, but anyway, it just kind of went on, and, and then I, that's what you do, isn't it? When you're raising children is you at least take them to church. So we took them to church and uh, did everything that was right. And... One of the guys that I taught with happened to be an elder at this uh, RPCES church, uh, which later became a PCA church. And he said, you know, I said, I didn't even know that you were a believer after seeing me at church. And I said, well, I, I am, and I'd like to learn a lot more about the church. And he swears to this day that I said, I want to learn more about Jesus. And he scheduled an afternoon lunch with me, and we got together in one of the conference rooms there at the academy. And... Uh, he shared Christ with me, and at 1242 on November 24th, 1979, I was on my knees asking, I didn't do a 180, I did a, like a 720. I was just, my life changed so much, it was, it was just crazy. And uh, so anyway, that's me. And a lot of the things that you'll hear from me, you need to keep them kind of into that kind of background. And uh, just to know where I came from and, and those kinds of things. But I want to jump into our study because I know that we're, we like to have our fellowship time here at uh, Harvest, and I think it's wonderful. And so we're going to aim to try and be on time. Uh, as a military officer, that's one of the things that I learned as you try to do things right and, and properly and in an order. So it's just a quick overview of the study as it says there on your outlines. If you didn't get an outline, there's some more back there in the back if you, if you like to grab one. But... I'm a lover of our church standards. I love the Westminster Confession of Faith and the shorter catechism and the large, larger catechism, and I think they're wonderful. And one of the first things that I learned when I first came to Christ was this first question, what is the chief in a man? 
An easy part is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And the purpose of this class is simply that, to better know the God whom we glorify and the God whom we are to enjoy into eternity. Hey, listen, if y'all don't like glorifying God now, heaven's going to be a bummer. I mean, it's just not going to be a lot of fun. And so what we want to do is to learn more and more about them because, you know, as, as you all remember back when, you know, the first person that you dated seriously, the more you got to know them, the more they meant to you. Well, I hope they did. I hope that was the case. But if that wasn't the case, then, you know, you moved on to somebody else, I'm sure. So what you want to do is know more and more and more about God. And the interesting thing about it is our God is incomprehensible. The theological term is that he's incomprehensible. That doesn't mean that we can't know him at all. What that means is that we will never know everything about him. I think in eternity day plus one, we're still going to be learning about God. And we're still going to be marveling about our God. Let me just read you a quick comment that uh, Dr. Ferguson uh, put in the endorsement for our book. And we'll talk about the book in just a second. He said, a young man once told me that one night he dreamed he saw an army of theologians coming over the horizon to him. At the front leading the charge was R.C. Sproul, of course. So read this book and you will understand the dream for here is theology rooted in scripture nourished by the best of the church's theologians and expounded with the clarity and simplicity that is the hallmark of a master theologian communicator. Do you need to be a theologian to read this book? Of course you do. But that's the point of the title. You are. The real question is whether you're a good one or you're not so good one. So read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest everyone's a theologian. By the time you're finished, you will almost certainly be a healthier and happier one. So this is all going to be about focusing on the fact that you are a theologian. And, and in a moment, we're going to read a passage from Scripture that points out to you that you are a theologian, whether you want to believe it or not. That the person that would never darken the door of a church is still a theologian. They're just not a good one. But we're going to look more and more how we can become a, a theologian and be a good one. So just let me just mention one other thing now that Brent's here. Uh, 71 years old, 26 years in the military, I don't hear so well. Uh, and, and I have not gotten over my, uh, my feeling that I don't need hearing aids. I think I do. But I think everybody that does 20 years. So Brent is here especially. He's going to be teaching half our classes. But he's here on days that I'm teaching, and I'm asking him to always sit in the front row to hear your questions and then to relay them to me so I can understand them. And one of the things that I found out is I'm probably a really good lip reader, so at a distance I can't read your lips. So Brent's going to pass them on and, and help me to understand them a little bit better. Um, so what are the resources we're going to use for this study? First and foremost, we're going to use the Bible. Okay, that's the basis for those standards that I love. That's the basis for all knowledge that is worth knowing. And I'm going to back that up in just a few minutes. In here, uh, the hard copy is uh, $20.80. The paperback's $14.40. It's a little bit more expensive from Amazon, but Amazon has it available in Kindle for $8.99 if you'd like to have it a little bit better. And for those of you that like a sale, uh, every, every, well, every week Ligonier has what they call $5 Fridays. This last week, the paperback was on sale for $5, okay? But that means that it'll come back around and be on sale. You shouldn't hit your mother. That was mean. So they said, Mom, you should have bought the book. So, and she hit back. That's the way to go. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> okay, Amazon's got them a little cheaper, and, but it has, uh, has the Kindle as well. The study guide is the best $1 you'll ever spend. So let me encourage you because the study guide is not going to be an outline. We're going to try and give you a, a, a little bit of an outline each week to let you know where we're going in the lesson. Uh, the study guide is not an outline, but it really highlights the important topics. 
And it has some good questions in there that you may want to be asking yourself. And it's got the answers to the questions at the back, which is even better. So it's a good dollar. You go to ligonier.org, you go to the store, you put in everyone's a theologian, and you can buy that for a dollar. And if uh, and download it. If uh, if you can't do that, let me know. I'll be more than glad to to get you a copy. So we'd like to do that. Okay. The next three things are definitely the standards from our denomination: the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the Westminster Larger Catechism. And one of the things that I, that I like to do with the uh, with our standards is to use them as an index into our scripture. Okay, the scripture is number one. It has preeminence. It is the firstborn among, among all literature. It is the thing where we go. But as you read through the Westminster Confession with scripture proof text, what you see happening is it gives you verses that takes you into the scripture to show you uh, different, teach, different areas where you can go. So like, for example, if you want to learn about the sovereignty of God, you go into the Westminster Confession, you look at the chapter on God, you look at the, sub, the paragraph that talks about God's sovereignty, and about every four words, there's going to be a reference into the scripture. So then you can go and look at each one of those texts and really help to learn more about the sovereignty of God. Now, just to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert here, that's exactly what systematic theology is all about. And that's where we're going to be focusing during this uh, study. It is looking throughout the scriptures at a particular topic and seeing what the scripture has to say on that particular topic. So if the topic, the doctrine you're interested in is the sovereignty of God, then what you want to do is you want to look at all the references in the scripture that talk about the sovereignty of God, okay, in a systematic, orderly way. And that's where we're going to be going with this study. So that's it for the resources. Those are all great. We're going to be bringing in some other uh, shorter resources, but we we're, want we're, to really be focusing in. Now, the cool thing in about six weeks, we're going to start in, uh, in the evening with Dr. Gerstner's uh, Westminster Confession of Faith videos. Those are going to just, just hook right in to what we're studying here. And if you didn't know, Dr. Gerstner was one of R.C. Sproul's mentors. So, I mean, if you take R.C., who is just wonderful, and my, okay, I'll admit it. I think Dr. Sproul was amazing. And I think the effect that he's made on the world is amazing. And I'm, I love Ligonier. Let me just ask you, how many of you in here have been to the Ligonier National Conference? Okay. Here's a few of you. Well, it's really cool. Maggie and I moved here a year ago from Lakeland, Florida. We were about 90 miles away from Sanford, where uh, Ligonier is. And we enjoy loved that conference oh, 12 or 13 times. And it was just really, really cool. And she liked it, too, I can tell. So, But OK, so why is it important to undertake this study? First of all, it's important to build your own faith. And uh, this study will do nothing. The more you know God, the more you will be in awe of him. And as we study the attributes of God, Brent gets to teach that lesson uh, on the communicable attributes of God. Uh, you're just going to just be overwhelmed about who God really is. And the stronger your faith, the stronger your own assurance. And the stronger your own assurance, the more likely you are to share your faith with somebody else. And the more likely you are to share your faith with somebody else, the more opportunities God is going to bring your way to do exactly that. So to build your own faith is probably one of the most important reasons that we should undergo this study. Another one is to be able to discern God's truth from the world's truth. And we're going to be talking about the different views of truth here in just a couple of minutes. But, uh, you know, truth, tr the word truth is listed 165 times in the English Standard Version. It's listed 237 times in the Authorized Version. So in some context, truth has been transformed into knowledge or wisdom in the ESV. But I mean, that's a word that you find throughout the scriptures. Okay, Ligonier fans, Romans 12, 2. Okay, the, the theme verse for Ligonier. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. 
So to discern God's truth, you must know God's truth and then be able to lay that off against the world. You know, when, when Paul was talking about uh, to the Corinthians and he mentioned the Bereans, does anybody remember why he mentioned the Bereans? They, they loved it, okay, but what did they do with it, Tom? Exactly, Demi, okay. That's exactly what they did, that when they heard something, they pulled out the Word of God, and they tested what they heard against the Word of God. And you can't do that if you don't know the Word of God. And so that's what, again, that's another emphasis that we're going to be facing. First John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. And uh, so it's important that you are able to test your faith, test the things that you hear, test the world's truth against God's truth, and you must know God's truth. Third reason is to be guided by the truth. Hebrews 13, 5 through 9, says, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we're going to keep coming back to that passage throughout our study. But he says, do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted through them. So remember, God never changes. It's a good investment of your time, okay, to be here studying God's Word because that knowledge is going to be truthful. The knowledge you gain will never be lost. The phrase, know God, 241 times in the ESV. I mean, that's important, isn't it? If it's listed that many times in the Scripture, as you can tell, I, I, I have a Bible app, and I really love it. If you don't have a Bible app, you need to get one. There's some really great ones, but I like Olive Tree if you're looking for a good Bible app. And then finally, the fourth is the most important reason, and we've already talked about, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why you should be learning about Him. Okay, a couple of quick class ground rules, and then we'll jump into the uh, topic for the day. Uh, we're going to take our time, and we're going to cover the material as we need. The session has given Brent and I the opportunity to go through this at the pace that is necessary. And... Um, there's a lot of chapters in here. You know, if we need more time, we're going to take it. And, uh, but if we need less time, we'll speed up too. So y'all let us know uh, how we're doing and how we're going as far as timing. But, you know, we plan on uh, getting as much of this in as we can by the end of the Sunday school year. By the time we break again for summer, we would really like to be through the vast majority of the book, if not all the way through it. And one last thing is the only bad question is the one that you don't ask. So I don't mind if we, you know, diverge, if we head down a tangent. to you know ask the question and like I said the only bad one is the one that you don't ask and there's one other thing um, you know and you may need free to say whoa okay raise your hand and say slow it down and I'll be glad to do that uh, and if, if I've got my head down and you want to ask a question you know make a noise and I'll Look up, and, and we'll go from there. So with all that said, let, let's get rolling. What is theology? What is it? Really simple, okay? It comes from two Greek words, theos and logos. Okay, you all know logos, don't you? Logos, one translation is word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten Son of God. Well, word in that case is used in the Greek sense of reason. That says, in the beginning was the reason. 
and the reason was with God, and the reason was God. And we all know that the Logos was self-identified as Christ himself. But another use of the word Logos is as knowledge, is as logic, as, as uh, you know, it's just why is something the uh, document on Christology. It said, theology defined most simply is the study of God. logic or reason, the meaning of the term has, over the centuries, remained close to its etymological origin, the study of God, meaning it's, it is what it says that it is. Theology is also a science. Now, what's a science? That's gathering facts, and that's applying reasonable inferences and coming up with a conclusion based on those facts. So theology is also a science. Where are the facts that we use for theology? We find them lying around on the ground somewhere? Where are they? Right, Doug, just what you said. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. He didn't really say that. I'm just picking on him a little bit. Okay, so it is a science, but the science, the facts that we use are from the Scripture. So in the old Latin sense of scientia, a branch of knowledge, apex and unifying subject of human understanding, all knowledge has become fragmented as a result since only theology can unite all knowledge while respecting its diversity. Without theology to hold knowledge together, universities, and it says that's what university means is truth, one truth, have become multiversities. That means there's lots of truth in uh, being espoused as truth in universities. If, however, all truth is God's truth, then there is no reason why all branches of knowledge could not be reunited with theology at the head. Just a quick side story. When I first became a Christian, the, the, the guy that led me to Christ invited uh, Maggie and I and a few other people over for uh, lunch after church one Sunday. And we went into their home, and there were, you know, things all over that pointed to Christ. And Christian music was playing in the background. And as we drove home, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned, boy, these people are really sold out. I mean, they really, everything about them is about God. Well, you know what? Everything is about God. When we start looking at difficult questions, we need to not start with the world's experts. We need to start with God and know that God is sovereign over his world and know that all the knowledge that we need to know really starts with God because he created it all. And he put all this in order, and not only did he create it, but he is sovereign over it. He superintends it. Listen to what Calvin had to say. He said, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. So we, we hear, you know, all the knowledge that we have is really starts with God. And then when we contrast ourselves with God and know the depths of our sin as compared to his perfection, then we start to see the truth. Chris Larson, the, the president at Ligonier, he said the word theology simply means a study of or about God. Theology is no dry and dusty academic pursuit. Theology is a razor's edge with life and death on either side. The Israelites had a correct theology and lived. The Assyrians had a corrupt theology and perished. The stakes could not be higher for each soul. Jesus Christ said that to know God and the one whom he has sent is to enter into eternal life. If you ever want to know what is eternal life, go to John 17:3. Okay, eternal life is to know God and his son, Jesus Christ. So Derek Thomas, another one of the Ligonier teaching fellows, is always going to take us back to the Puritan, said the Puritan Williams Perkins infamously defined theology as the science of living blessedly forever. His contemporary, William Ames, mimicked Perkins by calling theology the science of living for God. Since living for God is every Christian's duty and joy, every Christian must be a theologian and must be a good one. Sinclair Ferguson, uh, another Ligonier fellow. Sorry, folks, that's where this material really focuses me on those teaching fellows. It says, theology, the truth that is from God and about God, is for the life of the church. 
Jesus is building his church by making disciples who follow him, confessing the truth that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Disciples are those to whom Jesus gives life so that they will walk in his way according to his truth. And Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's go uh, one more uh, definition. And I think the most important comes right from uh, the scripture, uh, Romans 1. And Romans 1, 18 to 25, not only tells us about the truth, but it tells us about the day in which we live where the truth is suppressed so badly. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Again, Brent's going to talk about uh, general revelation and special revelation. We just talked about, of course, with general revelation, what we can learn about God from his creation. Special revelation is what we learn about God from his word. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So we can see in all these things, there is one underlying thing. Once again, I'm going to beat it again. It's about truth. Theology is the knowledge of God, and everyone has a stake in it. And whether or not they admit to knowing God or not, they are a theologian. Those that do not know God, do not admit who he is, are theologians, are just bad ones. So what the theology is not? It's not religion. Okay, Religion is how people practice uh, their their worship of various things religion is a man, is a man thing it's the the practices the rituals we go through and if you look at universities today religion is still being studied but it's typically being studied in sociology or anthropology departments so it's it's a study of man philosophy is another thing uh, that theology is not it's the, philosophy is a, is a search for general understanding of values and reality by speculative rather than observational means. In other words, you kind of figure out how you feel, and then that feeling becomes your philosophy, how you'll react in life. Another synonym uh, that many people use for that are your worldview. If somebody says, what's your philosophy, what's your worldview, hopefully everyone in here, this room would say, well, I believe that God created the world, Okay, that he is sovereign over his world and that he superintends his world and that everything that happens is part of his view. Somebody else may say, well, you know, I kind of, I'm, you know, as, as Sproul talks about, I'm an existentialist. That means there is no general reason for truth. Uh, it is what it is. Things just happen. Okay, that's where I come from. And if something bad happens, well, something bad happens, something good happens, well, okay, that's, that's even better. So philosophy has really impacted the study of theology. You'll see uh, philosophies, and, and not really good philosophies, uh, really impacting the church. And uh, what happens is, as a result of that, you start seeing, um, you know, people come up with some pretty wild ideas because they come up with ideas out of their own heads and out of their own hearts, and rather than from the Word of God. And so that, that's what philosophy, and that's how it's affected and impacted the study of theology in the church today. So a little bit more about theology. Just kind of think of anything that ends in ology, and, and it kind of helps you. Biology is the study of life. Uh, anthropology is the study of man. Theology is the study of God. It refers to God and all that he has revealed. It's a very broad study. Now, let me show you some of the areas that we're going to cover. First, we're going to cover theology proper, which is when we talk about God, the three in one. We talk about the Godhead. 
and we're going to talk about theology proper and understand uh, that theology about God. Anthropology is the study of man and the study of creation and, and how we react in it. Christology, the study of Christ. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. That's an easy one to remember. Pneumatic drill, pneumatic anything has to do with wind. The Holy Spirit is our holy wind. Okay, pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Soteriology, the study of the atonement of Christ. That can, that's one of my favorite sections in this whole book. Ecclesiology, the study of the church. Hamartiology is the study of sin. You can remember that one by harm, harm archaeology. Okay, it's a study of the harm that is done. And eschatology is the study of future things. But the main focus of this book is on systematic theology, and we've talked about it. It's an orderly, coherent study of the principal doctrines of the Christian faith. So many people don't like that term, systematic theology. And you'll find that if you look at a lot of seminaries, a lot of seminaries have actually given up classes called systematic theology, systematic. Some of them have even done away with their systematic theology departments at their seminary. Uh, just because people don't like the term. They react negatively to it because they have a secular philosophy. They have a secular worldview. You know, they think that, well, well what we're trying to do with systematic theology is, is take the Bible and stuff it into our own private presuppositions. They think we're trying to make the Bible say something that it doesn't really say. But systematic theology does the very opposite. Systematic theology looks across scripture and looks at a topic and studies that topic in detail. Systematicians often also go to the church fathers to see what the church fathers have said about a particular topic. So they study that one topic as much as they possibly can. Let me give you an example of systematic theology that will probably just jump right out at you and probably help you just understand very easily what it is, uh, is the doctrine of the Trinity. How many times is the word Trinity mentioned in the scripture? How many? Zero. Okay. Now we know that the Father is God, that the Son is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God. We know that there is one God. Okay, so how do you look at those things and how do you make them harmonize? Well, what you do is you start looking across the scripture and studying all the passages that relate to who God is. And then suddenly you start to realize we have three persons in one God as taught consistently, coherently, and with great unity across the scripture. That's what a systematician does. He looks at a topic and he digs down into it. So the key assumptions of, the, of systematic theology is, first of all, that God has revealed himself not only in nature, but in nature. So as we study the same attributes, and then finally the presupposition that a theologian takes is that God's revelation in Scripture manifests those very qualities. God's word is excellent, as he is. So there's unity. You know, we look across 66 books. You know, starting the index, go all the way to the maps. There's one message, and that message is salvation history. That message is how we are saved. You know, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. How many of them are there no sin? Two. Okay? Genesis 3, man falls. And from then on, it's the history of man's sin and God's salvation. It's amazing. Uh, 40 writers, three different languages, written over 4,000 years, covers many topics and includes multiple kinds of literature. But within that diversity is unity. Just like in the Trinity where there is diversity within that unity, the Bible reflects God. There is coherence. Jerome, uh, one of the... Uh, fourth century uh, church fathers who translated the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into the version of the scripture in Latin called the Vulgate. Many of you may have heard of the Latin Vulgate. That was Jerome who did that translation. 
Here's, here's something he says about the coherence. He says, the scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for the theologian to swim in without ever touching the bottom. Okay, that's been spun around lots of times. I think Dr. Sproul would use one about it's you know, shallow enough for a babe to walk across, but deep enough for an elephant to drown. I mean, there's lots of different ways of looking at it, but it's an amazing collection of God's revelation. And then there's consistency. And that's the wonderful thing about it. The same message is coming. Now, there may be different administrations during different covenants. Okay, in the old covenant, we may have seen the administration with all the rituals and ceremonies where today in the covenant of grace, we see a different administration of those, that same wonderful topic. But those three assumptions guide the systematic theologian. So when the systematic theologian is trying to figure out what something means, they go back and they trust God's word. They study across God's word and they look what God's word has to say. And we've already talked about that one example uh, of the Trinity. They understand that each point in theology addresses every other point. It's all hooked in together. Think about the Ten Commandments, if you will. Okay, if you break the first commandment, you broke them all, haven't you? If you take God off his throne and put your own feelings ahead of God and break that first commandment, then you've broken all of them. Okay, look at the Ten Commandments to covet. Okay, if you covet, you're basically saying that God is not sovereign and that you don't have things that you really think you need from God. And so therefore, what, what you're doing is you're breaking the first commandment by breaking the 10th commandment, which breaks them all. It's all connected together. So whenever there is a question, start with God, just like the systematic theologian does. So the goal of systematic theology then is to look at the Bible as a whole, put it together, and show how it fits into a meaningful whole. You know, believe it or not, we've covered pretty much everything we meant to cover for today. Uh, we've covered what theology is, what it's not. We've covered some important terms. We've talked about areas of theology. We've talked about systematic theology and key assumptions of the systematic the theologian. So how do we put these into knowledge, into practice today? How do, we, how do we act on them even today? One is to know that God is knowable, yet he is incomprehensible, meaning we can always learn more and more about him. We can know him, but ought not all about him. The more we know, the more we will love and serve him. And we are bound to spend eternity future glorifying him and learning more about him every day. And I look forward to it. And pray for the work of the Holy Spirit. And Brent and my life, as we uh, teach through this material, as we learn together with you in this material and pray that in your lives uh, that God will help you to learn more and more about him and come to love him more. So next week, Brent's going to be looking at the uh, knowledge of theology and how it affects each of our lives every day. He's going to be drilling down into that. Uh, Brent's going to be teaching for the next couple of weeks. Uh, Maggie and I are planning to be out of town. Uh, and so... He's going to be taking that and running with it. And let me close with, with something I just saw from Spurgeon. And this is more about what we're going to be doing in just a few minutes when we come back in here to worship. So uh, Spurgeon said, Then, dear friends, public worship is a part of the great system by which God blesses the world. It has much to do with the gathering, the sustenance, the strengthening, the invigorating, and the extension of the Church of Christ. And it's through the church Christ that God accomplishes his purposes in the world. Oh, the blessings that come to us in our public assemblies. Are there not sometimes days of heaven upon earth? Have we not felt our hearts burning within us when we have been listening to the word of God or joining in praise or prayer? Those houses of God where the gospel is truly preached, whatever their architecture may be, are the beauty and the bulwarks of the land. God bless them. And may God bless Harvest Presbyterian Church as we enter into worship this morning. May God be glorified in the prayers that are prayed, in the sermon that is preached. Eric will put a little heavy on you on that one. And in all things that we do, every song that we sing, may God be glorified. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for being our God. 
for loving us so much that you would call us to be your children. God, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for your and your electing grace working in our lives. Father, we pray that you would focus us on this study and on your word, more importantly, Father, every day. And let us, as we look at the world around us, let us put on that Christian worldview where we start with you when we have questions, where we start with your revelation when we need to answer those questions and when we seek to glorify you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us together for worship. We pray that you be with our preacher as he preaches this morning, Father. And we pray that in all things you would be glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.